Parks Natural Areas Coordinator and Wes Messenger, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Willamette Valley Project Botanist for a talk on prairies, petals, and pollinators of the Southern Willamette Valley. In this two-segment presentation, Mr. Alverson will show a selection of landscape photographs taken throughout the year, providing a seasonal record of changes and time series for natural areas. Uh, Ms. Mes Mr. Messenger, who you may remember from last April's talk on biodiversity of Western Oregon native bees, will discuss pollinator species, prairie plants, and will explain how native bee communities and their behavior change from when the first willows bloom through the last gasp of the asters in the fall and into the cold of winter. With spring wildflowers blooming in nearby natural areas, tonight's Science Pub will be a great opportunity to learn about um, the greater and greater appreciate spring in the Southern Willamette Valley. And with that, we will welcome our first speaker, Ed Alverson. Thank you, Maggie. Um, Maggie asked me to do a little bit more to introduce myself, and um, I've lived in uh, Lane County for more than 25 years, um, working in um, habitat conservation, restoration area. And one of the things about doing this kind of work is that it's not actually as glamorous as it might sound. <laughs> we sp spent a lot of time in the office and on the phone and on the computer and um, if we're out in the field we're usually at our project site so that means going back to the same place um, and we don't necessarily need have the opportunity to really get out so I, what I'm going to show you is a uh, result of a project that I sort of a side project that I did on weekends over a 10-year period um, I went to 10 different sites, actually one site every calendar year around the Eugene Springfield area and I took photos and went out weekly. Uh, so once a week over a calendar year, starting on the winter solstice and then going all the way through to the next one. And so um, this is a decade long project, um, but it was an opportunity to kind of experience places close at hand in a different way than I would normally during kind of the, the work world. And what I'm presenting today is just a couple of sets, well, four different sets of photos from two different sites. Um, so from two different years, because there were two years that I visited sites that are in the Coast Fork watershed. So those two sites, which you can see on this map, well, um, on the far right is Mount Pisgah, I don't have a pointer, so I can't point to it. And then in the bottom center is Spencer Butte. And then the other places indicated on this map are places I went to for these for the other eight years. So just a little bit more about what I'm going to show you. See, I think I can move it to the next one without starting it. Okay, so here's a scene, and I set it up so that I was able to more or less capture the same scene every time I went back to the site. So what you're seeing is kind of a time sequence of 53 photos over a year. And part of the reason I was interested in doing this is because nature operates and different components of nature operate on uh, time scales that are kind of outside of our immediate human experience. Now you can probably remember what you did yesterday. Probably you can remember what you did a week ago. You kind of remember what you were doing maybe, you know, in December. But what were you doing a year ago today? You know, we, don't, we just, it's not important to us to know that unless we write it down. And so from an evolutionary biology standpoint, our brains are not wired to experience the world that way. And then if you think from the standpoint of a bee, you know, how long does a bee live, you know, from, I don't know, maybe, well, Wes will tell us, a few days to a few months or a butterfly, and the scale of their world, you know, it's a very small neighborhood. So they experience the world in a completely different way. So I was just kind of thinking that by compiling photos like this, I could just experience a place in a way that you can't normally 
uh, by going to visit it in person. That was kind of what was behind all this. Uh, this first set of photos is taken at Mount Pisgah, and it's on the south side, or southeast side of Mount Pisgah, where many fewer people go. But it's a great area to explore, and it's really, from a botanical standpoint, one of the most diverse parts of the park. Um, there's a lot to see out there. Um, and uh, so there's a lot going on there. And also, in terms of habitat management, there's a lot going on there. And so this set of photos was taken in the uh, starting about a month, about two months after a prescribed burn. So we know that fire was an important ecological influence in the Lamont Valley. So what you're going to see is what you get in the spring and summer following a fire. We have some oak trees here. And so, and, and then in the background, there's prairie. So you can kind of see a bit of this landscape mosaic of prairies and savannas. In the background, there's oak woodlands. There's a patch of Douglas fir forest in the background. So there's all sorts of things to see in this. Now, our, our lighting conditions are not optimal here. It's still light outside. It would be better if the room was dark. But Maggie tells me that when this is posted on YouTube, they'll be using the original photos. So if you can't really see things really well this time, you can go to the YouTube site and see a better version of it. So I'll just mention that. OK, so I have this automatically set up to advance every couple of seconds. So we can just sit back and watch things go. And I'll do a little bit of narration. But we're starting in. Uh, December, January, February. Um, it looks pretty sunny. I don't know why. Maybe this is a sunny, sunny winter. Maybe not typical. Um, but what we're seeing is the grass that's starting to grow, but it's still very short. Scattered oak leaves that had fell off the oak trees the previous fall. Um, but gradually, you get into late winter and things get greener. But that, this year, we had actually a March snowstorm. And then all of a sudden, spring arrived. And these flowers are Oregon fawn lily, so they're one of the early spring bloomers. But they stop at about early April, and then the camas comes on. So for a few weeks, there's a lot of camas, but then that fades away. Now all you see are the camas seed pods. But there are other things like death camas and iris and lamation. The white flowers here are death camas, completely unrelated from the common camas. And now we're into June, and you can see that the grasses are starting to grow up fairly tall. And uh, later in June, the camas seed pods start to mature and release the seeds. And so, you know, by early summer. There's not a whole lot blooming anymore. There are a few things here and there. But we get into this summer dry period, the summer drought. We have a what's called a Mediterranean climate. So things are really dry and brown. Um, and we can just let things go along. And uh, into September, things still stay really dry. I think that's about where we are now. And then finally, in September, early October, we get enough rain that you start to see a little bit of green. And the leaves fall off later in October, early November. And the grasses are no longer upright. They're kind of reclining, going to sleep. And then a little bit more snow. This is in December. And then we're at the winter solstice again, and the year is over. OK, so that's one view at Mount Pisgah. And I have a couple more that I'll show you. Um, the next one is uh, enough rain that you start to see a little bit of green. And the leaves fall off later in October, early November. And the grasses are no longer upright. They're kind of reclining, going to sleep. And then a little bit more snow. This is in December. 
and then we're at the winter solstice again, and the year is over. Okay, so that's one view of Mount Pisgah, and I have a couple more that I'll show you. Um, the next one is uh, nearby, but a different kind of habitat within this prairie landscape. You can see there's some savanna and oak woodland in the background, but through the center of the photo, there's this seasonal stream, rivulet, so this kind of seasonal temporary aquatic habitat. And so that creates a different flora. So you might s think of a prairie as being kind of this open expanse that's, so again, we're starting um, winter solstice, and the amount of water in this little seasonal stream just will vary depending upon how much rain there had been in the week before. So you can see it's kind of fluctuating. Up and down. And some vegetation starting to grow after the fire. But over the winter, not a whole lot of change until we get into late winter. Let's look for that snowstorm again. I think it's coming up. We are getting more green. There's the snow and a big flush of melt water coming off. Now things are getting really green now that we're into early spring. Some buttercups starting to bloom. And I think maybe this, this set of photos has a lot of intricate detail that you're not gonna be able to see, but there's camas in the background, kind of a blue patch of that. Um, White flowers, and um, there's a bunch of native clover in the middle. White flower, here is the uh, harvest lily, Trudelia hyacinthina, all of a sudden coming out, grows from a bulb. And uh, brodea is the purple flower. There's a patch of milkweed here, the narrow leaf milkweed. And uh, one of the times I visited, I saw a monarch butterfly flying here. Now we're into July and things are really getting dry. All the water is gone. We haven't had any rain for a while. We're in the dry season. And this is kind of, you know, illustrative of my experience in a lot of these habitats. Things are pretty similar from week to week in the summer, similar week to week in the winter and then spring and fall are these really rapid transition times. So I think now we're kind of getting into fall, the leaves are turning color on the oak trees. Now there's a little bit of water in our seasonal stream again and now we've had enough rain to actually get the stream flowing. the snow returns. So again, yeah, we're thinking of prairies as more than just kind of flat, monotonous, grassy places. There's all this, all this diversity. So now my last series from Mount Pisgah is um, right on the bank of the Coast Fork. And so this is something that people don't necessarily realize that prairies and oak savannas can go right up to the edge of the riverbank. So if we're thinking of riparian habitat, you know, typically we think of forests, sloughs, wetlands, but in a lot of places in the Willamette Valley, there was prairie that came right up to the bank of the river. And in, in fact, most of the uh, cities and towns in the Willamette Valley were, es were established in places where prairie habitat went right up to the bank of the river and it was a high bank, so high above the flood zone. And with prairie going right to the riverbank, that made it really easy for people to access the river for transportation. The rivers were the transportation corridors in those early days. It was really hard to go overland, especially in the winter when everything was muddy. So anyway, that, that's my little lecture about riparian prairies. Um, the other thing about this sequence is that it's a panorama of three photos that has sort of been stitched together. So let's go through a sequence of the bank of the Coast Fork uh, where the, the prairie meets the river. And since this is a panorama, it's probably a, you know, at least a 100 degree view, maybe 100, maybe 180. 
Um, so there's a lot going on. It's interesting to see the fluctuations in the water levels in the river and the exposure of the rocks and the gravel bars in the river. But not much sign of life in the, in the prairie on the left yet. Now it's just sort of starting. There's our snowstorm in March, and now it's gonna start turning green. And here we're seeing camas again, blooming under the oak trees. There we go. For a couple weeks. All of the deciduous trees are now leafing out. We're into May. I guess we had a late spring rainstorm that brought a lot of water down the river. And then after a week or two, things lowered. Probably a lot of the same flowers that were in the earlier photos. They're just kind of smaller and harder to see in this version. And the grasses are growing up tall. It's probably early summer now. Things do stay somewhat greener along the river because of the proximity to water, but on this rocky bank, it's still pretty dry by the uh, middle of summer. Now we're getting into September and in into fall. Leaves are turning, ash trees turning yellow, oaks kind of a brownish red. And the leaves fall, and now we're into October. And the river comes up. A little bit of snow. Then we're into the, the long, dark gray winter. Okay, I have one more to show you from the summit of Spencer Butte, so I need to set up a different file. Let's see. <laughs> okay, is it ready to go? Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, whoops. Didn't quite want to start it. I'm going to skip down here. I've got um, thousands of photos, and I could be here all night showing them, which I won't do. Um, whoops. Didn't want to start from the start. Up. Yeah. There we go. Current slide. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we're standing on the summit or near the summit of Spencer Butte looking towards the southeast and um, looking towards Camas Swale. That's the large flat green area in the middle distance. And then the um, Kalapuya Divide and the Cascades in the background. And it was a pretty interesting year hiking up to the top of Spencer Butte every, uh, every week. There was actually one week where I was not able to get to the summit because there was so much snow. It actually wasn't how deep the snow was, but there were the, the snow made it so that all of the trees along the trail were leaning over the trail. And the only way to get up the trail was to crawl. And I decided that I wasn't going to crawl to the summit of Spencer Butte. So, okay, so um, December 21st was a nice sunny day. This was a week later. <laughs> and so we're going to kind of go in and out. Um, but there were definitely times when it felt like I was climbing into the Alps, really.
Now we're not really going to be able to see much in the way of wildflowers um, at this scale, but um, I just thought you'd enjoy viewing the, the larger landscape to provide a little context on the Coast Range watershed and the different uh, types of vegetation cover from the open rocky bald at the top of Spencer Butte with scattered oaks and incense cedar. Um, just south of Spencer Butte, there's an interesting area of ponderous, where there's a lot of ponderosa pine. Sort of the, on the right side of the screen in the middle ground um, is the Cresswell Oak site, which is a large area of oak, savanna, and woodland. Um, on a sunny day, you can probably see Cresswell in the background, and maybe Cottage Grove is there at the upper right. So we're now we're into the summer, early summer. Things are definitely drying out. The habitat in the foreground is where rattlesnakes would have lived in the olden days. And people still do see rattlesnakes on top of Spencer Butte from time to time, despite all the people. So now we're in a late summer and the uh, Grass seed fields and camas swale have been harvested and replowed and probably replanted. And the clouds have come back in the early fall. Leaves are starting to change on the hardwoods, um, particularly the oak and maple. Some days the top is in the fog. Um, some days you're up above the fog as well. We'll get to see a few of those too. There we go, there we're above the fog. And see how th th green things have gotten again with the arrival of the fall rains. Okay, well, and that was that was a year from the summit of Spencer Butte. Um, I can take some questions if anybody has any. I am it's fine if you don't, too. <laughs> okay, one question. You mean the set from Spencer Butte? Yeah. Um, so what we were seeing was kind of a series of valleys and ridges, and the valleys mostly grassland, either farmland or pasture or grassland of some sort, and then the ridges with mostly a mixture of Douglas fir and oak. So I'm not sh sure exactly where you're talking about, but... Um, well, the camas swale was green, but then... Um, I think, actually, if you look closely, you'll see that some of it was actually black for a while. Like they did a field burn. This is in 2008 that I di took these photos. And then it's brown from, recent from being plowed. So maybe that was what you were seeing. Not sure. Anyway. There's tons of detail on these photos. So, you know, you don't get it all the first time. Yeah. Okay. So move on to Wes. Oh, Maggie has a question. So, so Maggie's question is, uh, how did I set my schedule? And it, I did not do these exactly seven days apart every time. <laughs> I tried not to bias my visits for convenience sake. Um, there were times when I was out of town for maybe up to 10 days, and so there'd be a 10-day gap, and, s and then the, on the shoulders of those, the sequence would only be maybe five days apart. So it varied, but it was close enough. Yeah. Okay. Well, if there are any other questions, we'll switch to the other presentation.
All right, Wes, come on up. <laughs> Let's give a quick round of applause for Ed as well. <laughs> and here we go. Wow. Yeah, I'm Wes. I've been working botany stuff in the Willamette Valley for a uh, couple decades. Uh, I appreciate Ed's introduction, which was all through the seasons. Well, I'll, s I'll probably be shortening my presentation to only include the growing season when there's flowers and bugs flying. So yes, I work for the Corps of Engineers. We manage land around in my shop around all 13 dams uh, in the Willamette watershed. And you may wonder what a guy who likes bugs and flowers is doing working for the engineers. It's in the regulations we maintain and um, enhance ecosystem function. And to do that, you gotta know what's on your sites. We call that inventory. And what's even more important, and I'll be emphasizing some tonight is not just the organisms that are there, but how they interact, which we call ecology. Last year, I went heavy into bee biodiversity based on their evolutionary history. There was a lot to that. This year, I wanna talk about the petals and pollinators you might run into at Bake Stewart Park through the spring and summer and how they interact from the earliest willows or before. Um, I'll set that up by giving a couple of seasonal rounds of, of the life cycles of native bees and native pollinators. And um, I'll take a detour into a couple of neat stories that are as much about evolution and plant mating systems as they are about uh, wildflower appreciation or pollinator interactions but there are stories that I haven't been able to do real justice to in the field during the Bikes to Blooms event in past years, so I wanted to get into them fairly deeply. So stay awake. <laughs> so when I talk about pollinators, I mostly talk about bees. They feed on pollen, other, um, other insects gen just aren't that great at pollinating things. And when I talk about bees, I mostly talk about native bees. Um, I'm gonna try not to snub the other insects. I will snub the honeybees. They do interact with wildflowers, but their only interactions with native bees are either as com competitors or as vectors for diseases. So they may have some negative effects on our native bee populations. So exactly zero bees in native bees in North America overwinter as colonies. Every native bee comes into the world in spring alone. The solitary bees, which either nest in the ground or in sticks, come out of their nests in spring. They overwinter either as pre-pupae or as, as um, pupae, very rarely as late in star larvae. But they come out of their nests in spring like this I, this is a common name of this I made up. It's the teddy bear bee. This habropoda or our common digger bees in early spring, or many of our bees, they live a very few short weeks or months. They do their nesting, provision their individual cells and their series of cells in various, various ways, and they die. A few kinds of native ground nesters in particular will build up populations through the summer, they'll keep nesting with their sisters um, and their daughters, and they'll build up huge populations like this Agapostamon, which you'll see. Uh, Allison started seeing them at Bake Stewart already this month, but they keep building populations and you'll see numerous specimens. Oh, just in your yard on your asters in l very late sum summer, August and uh, September. So this Agapostamon. So bumblebees, 
overwinter as queens, which have already made it in the previous fall. They overwinter wherever they can find shelter, in some duff, under a tree. They come out alone in the first of spring. The, the queen bumblebee finds a nest, often an abandoned ro rodent's nest, builds the first generation of her workers by herself, and then retires to the nest to tend brood while the workers, the succeeding generations of workers go out. And you'll see here the second bump of queens and males in this diagram come out towards the end of their particular species season. They may, the males die and the queens go hide out to overwinter. So as far as seasonality of native plants goes, the, some of the very earliest blooming, I count uh, spring as starting in January when the European hazelnuts bloom. This particular picture has both the European and our native hazelnut. That's pretty early for bug to be flying around. These guys don't depend on animals, of course. They're wind pollinators. So flies, not the best pollinators. But a lot of our early, early plants, maybe they can't be too choosy. They can't wait for a good bee population. They bloom when it's fairly cold. I think this Roman zafia, seen at Bake Stewart, um, probably gets pollination service from this hoverfly, surface fly. Another er early bloomer is our oso berry, kind of February time frame. Again, early, maybe can't be too choosy. Uh, what pollinates this? An evergreen student studied this in maybe the 80s or 90s and thought Polinia rudis, which is now known to be six species in North America, but this fly was the primary pollinator. Uh, another guy, Bob Menke, looked in his backyard in Corvallis and thought some beetles were the main pollinator. And it's worth noting here that in this plant, okay, it's, you guys know it's bad form to mate with your sister, <laughs> right? <laughs> probably produces problems down, down the line, even if it was socially acceptable. Cousins probably in the same, and you know, if you could mate with yourself, it'd probably be even worse. <laughs> so plants have evolved a lot of ways to avoid mating with themselves. Uh, except in a few cases. They have mechanisms to ensure their outcrossing. In this case, it's about as extreme as it gets. Also, berry plant is either male or female. So it has to have something to, tra to move pollen from one plant to another, or it won't make berries. That's the most extreme case. Okay, for those of you who did not have this kind of sex education in, in school, we're going to, I hired a really classy graphic artist. And we're going to just really quickly review the parts of a flower. OK. <laughs> Female parts are ovules. Those are the eggs, if you're an animal. They're surrounded by an ovary, uh, topped by a stigma, which is where the pollen goes and this grows down the style to fertilize the eggs. The anthers are separate. They hang out on the end of a filament. Um, and the petals, if you are pollinated by animals in particular, <laughs> are signaling the animals, so they should be fairly conspicuous. And they're saying, basically, they're saying, hey, weird interkingdom sex over here. <laughs> but, but can there be drawbacks to being too conspicuous? Think about it. We'll find out, but not yet. Uh, Again, a uh, native wildflower you can see in the Rau Basin, this example from Bake Stewart, that color isn't very attractive. It reminds me of rotten meat. Um, I know in a, a close relative of this plant, the chocolate lily smells exactly like Katie's diaper pail did. <laughs> um, so a lot of people say that this kind of represents fly pollination. Um, at its finest. I smelled one the other day and didn't get an odor at all, and a bee flew out. So when we talk about pollination syndromes, we have to remember there's variation in nature. So flies, this bombilius, bombilius, um, definitely a flower visitor, maybe, maybe not a pollinator. Um, you can see the plectritis she's visiting. She's in the Rau Basin, rarely at 
Bake Stewart, but certainly on the rocky balls as you drive around the reservoirs here. Also lays its eggs and its larvae eat baby bees. Okay, I'm, st I'm stepping out of seasonal order here. I'm going to skip ahead to mm, from early April to maybe early to mid-May. And um, do you recall the, the typical flowering diagram that had both male and female parts? We call that perfect or her hermaphroditic. Gives each flower a double chance to reproduce. That's an evolutionary advantage. So the osa berry has plants completely separated by sex. There's a word for that. <laughs> um, but it gets weirder. There are mixed mating sy systems uh, where some individuals, like this one, have perfect flowers. They produce both pollen and, and eggs. And some individuals are either only male or only female. Uh, and that's the case here. There are these perfect flowers, and then there are uh, female only flowers that um, don't produce any pollen. They have to be pollinated. <coughs> uh, one, way th one way this happens is called, pay attention, cytoplasmic male sterility, okay? Uh, don't have to remember that. I'll, I'll, I'm about to explain it with some high tone graphic art. <laughs> Plant cell. Now. You and me and plants have DNA, most of it in our nucleus, some of it in the mitochondria, which powers the cell, and plants get a little extra dose of DNA in their chloroplast. Turns out it's really common for something to go wrong in the DNA of the mitochondria so that the plant has this male sterility, which is a problem if you use, lose half your ability to transmit genetics to the next generation, we call that a, lo a loss of fitness. There's great evolutionary theory that shows those, should, those, male, those female only plants should go right out of the population. They should be selected against very heavily. So they, that would be the lack of survival of the less fit. There is a phenomenon where this will become important later, where changes in the nuclear genetics make up for the loss of male function and basically rescue the plant. So there may be a mitochondrial genetic uh, defect that is pulled out of an evolutionary death spiral by a change in the nucleus. So here's our friend, the checker mallow, without any male parts. And yet, and so our theory says, should be extinct, right? And that's barring other factors, like other bugs. So in the upper right, we see the larva of the um, gray hair streak. And the larva has been feeding on the flowers of Sedalsia in my nursery at work, which has turned it pink. And below, you see a weevil, which specializes on these checker mallows. It lays its eggs in the flower, and in many populations, the weevil larvae eat so many seeds that you can't find one, even if you look for hours. That's a lot of selection. And it turns out there's great science that shows that that selection acts differently on the larger, more conspicuous, perfect flowers Weevils prefer to visit the, the big perfect flowers, and so they reduce the fitness of the, of the male plus female flowers, allowing the persistence of the male only flowers in the population. And this was done in a closely related plant species that's rare on the coast. It looks like you're with me. Are you with me? because it gets weirder. So right now, at Bake Stewart, and oh, for example, on the curves on 99, just south of town, uh, this Nemophila 
men's ECI, the spotted version is growing in great, great displays. And it's an annual. It's one of my favorite spring plants. Um, it's almost completely gone by Bikes to Blooms. We usually find one or two. And I usually totally garble this story. So I'm glad you're sitting down and I have notes. So normally the plant has both anthers and female parts. And they keep away in both space and time by being ripe at different times and um, by bending away from each other so they don't mate with e themselves. And it's this thing's quite a, part of quite a complex of different varieties or species. And you can see where our variety goes off the California map on north to where we are. That's the white speckled variety. There are maybe a half a dozen or more great stories about this plant and how it interacts with animals. There's the specialist bees. Apparently, each species in California has its own personal species of early spring andrina or, or mining bee, except where evolution causes them to get confused. Um, there's great variation in color across the range. There's even great variation in color in the ultraviolet spectrum. So these photographs are what it looks like in, on the top row in visible light and on the bottom row in ultraviolet light. And it matters that bees can see in the ultraviolet spectrum. So these ultraviolet shapes may be signaling the pollinators. But I'm not going to tell that story <laughs> till later. N next year? So, in Nemophila, different populations have different mutations that cause male sterility. Each different male sterility mutation has a different nuclear rescue gene. This means if, the, if they're matched, we get a rescue and we get a perfect flower that continues on with all of the evolutionary fitness that it had before. If you get some hybridization and you get a mismatch, you get a loss in fitness for the whole population, potentially. So here, our graphic artist, in all of his talent, has illustrated the case where the nucleus has rescued the plant and it's perfect into the perfect flower state, and a case where it has failed to, with two different, the X and the zigzag, two different mitochondrial mutations. So you have a bunch, so in some populations, you have a bunch of female plants hanging out and persisting in an annual plant where evolution should work way faster. And what's accounting for this? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> but one factor may be this day-flying moth, which has been shown to preferentially feed on the big, symmetrical, perfect flower, and may be reducing the fitness enough to allow the female only flowers to persist. That might not be the only um, factor here. Because in at least one population, there's been enough inbreeding, which we agree is bad, socially at least, and in most cases, um, there's been enough inbreeding that a lot of the perfect flowers are selfing or mating with themselves. That messes up their progeny pretty badly. So it could be that inbreeding that gives the female only flowers the added relative fitness to persist in the population. Okay. That's as complicated as it, could get, it, as it gets. But one of the conservation points that I take away from this story and supports our, our general point that you should plant native plants that are not just native species, but native varieties and collections from close to where you live, is that 
Oh, say the highway department would plant a bunch of these blue California Nemophilas mm, just to make up an example along Highway 58. You might be bringing two populations together that when they breed, they have ultimately reduced fitness and it harms the native wildflowers and their pollinators. You came for science, that was science. <laughs> that is a pretty flower. What's the time look like here? I got a little bit. So we're now in the time of, of phenology in bo I of flowers and insects that we might see if we visit uh, Big Seward Park or any of our Rau River prairie remnants in at about the day before Mother's Day, for example. Uh, and we'll talk about that if you're there, but the deep spur hides the nectar reward, so you need to be strong, smart, and have a long tongue, <laughs> like the California bumblebee or the black face. which we're, we've seen every year, rain or shine, pollinating Delphinium menziesii at Bake Seward on May 10th-ish, 13th-ish. You know, we can see this. You have to have a really long tongue and also see red. Did you know bees don't see red? They see black if, it, if something's red. They see ultraviolet. They see what we call bee blue or, and bee, bee violet, but red is black. So if it's a red flower, probably mostly it's pollinated by birds. <coughs> and now we're past May and into the end of spring. Our Clarkias or, or um, Farewell to Springs will be blooming in the watershed late June into July. And they have another bunch of stories that I'll skip over fairly quickly here um, and that don't involve evolutionary theory. So the whole family, the evening primrose family that these guys live in, come from, has weird, weird pollen. It's mixed in with these things called vicin threads. It makes it cobwebby and sticky, and it makes it really hard to handle for your average bee. So we get specialization where the branched hairs and the electricity that a lot of bees carry around with them to make pollen stick to them and to help them carry pollen go away. And there are many examples um, from throughout the range of Owner Grace E population, um, pollination. These are from the southwest in California, as are, th are these guys. It's the simple branched, unbranched hairs that are the adaptation. And at Big Stewart, you know, we have a series of um, native sunflower bee that seems to specialize on this Clarkia. Um, there is one in California that's been collected that is known to specialize on, on um, Clarkia, but we haven't matched up the species yet. And of course, as the season wears on further, um, some sunflower pollen is either really bad for you if you're a bee, or, uh, toxic, or is um, just low in nutrition. And so it's hard for a bee who visits flowers and feeds one larva, one lump of pollen that it's gathered that day to survive on that. You know, colonial bees, maybe they can mix it up with some more nutritious pollen and use it for something. But if you are putting all of your baby's food in one little hole in the ground, you might want to either avoid the pollen of, of this aster tribe or figure out metabolic ways to deal with that pollen. And that's what a lot of the sp sunflower specialists have done. They can be reared on pure Asteria E pollen. Generalist bees can't. OK. That's kind of the, the, the last asters, or the end of the season. So come out to Bake Stewart Park if you want to see some wildflowers. Walk around with Allison and or me thinking about pollinators. Um, the Kennedys 
alternative high school kids in Matt Hall have planted about 30,000 native plants, out there, native wildflowers out there in the last three years, including geranium organum. Uh, we, su we successfully got a prescribed fire in last fall in the east, adjacent east wildlife area, so things are looking a lot different than they used to. And you're all invited. Here's some, here's some pictures that Allison took of pollinators that she's seen, I think mostly this year, this spring, on, um, at that site. And a Lorquin's Advil from 2014. Okay. Hornica, I think. Uh, Ruth asked what species of Romazophia, and I think it's Californica. <laughs> Allison. So, th yeah, so Allison comments that in the burn, the camas is starting to look really thick. That's a known response. Camas loves fire. Um, right now, I'd say the the small camas is at one percent bloom, ten percent, and the tall camas is maybe at twenty percent up there. But things are going to be looking pretty impressive in a few weeks. Cytoplasmic male sterility questions. <laughs> Come on. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and with that,